Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all, and thank you for coming and joining me in the Goddess Project podcast today. Whether you're listening on uh, Spotify or you're watching me on YouTube, welcome, welcome to the Goddess Project. Uh, my name is Carla Ionescu, and I am the host of the Goddess Project. And one of the things actually that I wanted to talk about today is the way that the Goddess Project podcast came to be just shortly, uh, because then we're moving on to snake goddesses. And so I'm very excited to talk about snake goddesses with you guys today. Um, I just wanted to share with you that the Goddess Project podcast came out of my own need or desire to continue the conversations that I have in class with my students or continue reviewing the topics that we cover and then we don't get to expand on because you know we have to get to the class material. And so if you're joining us today or joining me today, um, I hope that you will be relaxed and enjoying the conversation. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear from you in the comments or in the question section. Um, if you have any topics that you think are relevant to this topic, but also maybe some suggestions for future podcasts that you'd like me to talk about and cover, that would be really wonderful as well. Um, this is a um, this podcast is a little bit of this episode is a little bit of a transition for us so we're moving well not away from goddesses but we're moving into monsters and other creatures so for example next week we're going to do medusa um, and we're going to start working on for a couple of weeks on female monsters so i'm going to pick some female monsters although today is a great transition because we're moving away from um sort of traditional goddesses and we're going to look at these snake goddesses which in many ways are goddesses but also become these monstrous creatures and I think that really leads into women represented as monsters and that fear of angry dark powerful women if you don't know too much about me uh, you can find me anywhere online under Artemis expert uh, my field of research for my dissertation is Artemis um, she is my inspiration and a little bit my obsession and has really led me, I think, to, to being here um, and talking about all of the things that are really fascinating to me and, and hopefully to you as well. Uh, my dissertation is, of course, in Artemis. I wrote this book just now that was published about a month ago called She Who Hunts, um, Artemis, the goddess who changed the world. And I truly believe that she's an underrated goddess, the goddess that has been forgotten over the last couple of decades. And so I have a couple of more books left to write about her. Um, one of them is in progress. But in the meantime, I'm super, super interested uh, in caving uh, and caves. Uh, again, inspired by Artemis in the sense that I went to go see her caves when I was in Crete. And descending into the cave, you know, we, we did a whole podcast about caves. Um, if you haven't listened to it, you could look it up. Descending into that cave, I had an, an experience, I guess you could call it, not a revelation or a vision, nothing quite that amazing, but an experience of being in a dark and frightening place because caves tend to be, well, dark. And then there are birds and bats and all kinds of noises and movements and rocks are sometimes kind of shifting. And so I had this, this moment of both fear and warmth. I don't know how to explain it. And I realized that this is, this is the descent into sort of the underworld or the womb of the world that ancient people wrote about. And uh, I don't know, it just kind of hit me. And then as, you know, and then coming back up into the light. So when you're in a cave and you're looking at the mouth of a cave, you, it really does look like, you know, how people describe um, those uh, near-death experiences where you're seeing the light and you're walking towards it. And so, and you're in this way, in this sense, I was climbing towards it. Um, and so when you come back into the light, you are changed in some way. And so then I started caving in different places. I started looking for caves and I would descend into some very deep caves, uh, like the cave of Zeus, for example, in Crete is quite deep. You have to go down about hundred to 150 steps. Um, and then you keep going after that. Um, and just this experience became something that I'm right now 
very excited to do. Um, I am planning to go through the United States. I'm in Canada now. I'm, I'm planning to go through the United States this summer, um, just visiting caves and visiting other sacred sites um, and write this book on the experience of going into the darkness and coming back to the light. So that's my, that's the book I'm working on now while I'm promoting She Who Hunts. Um, and then down the road, I have another book on Artemis um, half done, yeah, two thirds done, we shall see. Yeah. So that's a little bit about me if you're new and uh, I hope that you will subscribe to my channel. Again, I'm new to YouTube and to podcasting. So hopefully, um, hopefully we can get to know each other. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to uh snake goddesses let's start working on snake goddess i'm gonna share my screen with you guys also i should say that um uh, my sorry <laughs> that my um podcasts are not edited so we are kind of going with the flow um i do that for two reasons the first one is i don't want to edit certain aspects. Um, I kind of want it to be natural. Yeah. And the second one is I'm not that great at making videos. <laughs> um, I'm not that uh, I'm learning how to make videos. I've just joined uh, TikTok. So I'm not that great at editing, but I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, but I like this idea of informally speaking. I like the idea of you seeing me as my natural self um, with all the imperfections that might come. And also in, it challenges me to stay focused. It challenges me to stop saying um every five minutes. It challenges me to, um, ah, see, I did it again. <laughs> to share with you in the same way that I would share with you if we were in a class or if we were um, having a discussion over dinner. So the title of this episode is snake goddesses, mothers, oracles, and prophets. Because believe it or not, snake goddesses are mothers, oracles, and prophets, yeah? which is uh, quite incredible. When we think about these three categories or roles for women, and we are now going to associate uh, many of the roles with snake knowledge yeah? and snake power, actually. So let's begin at the beginning. Yeah. I want to begin with the world egg, and then we'll talk about the Orphic egg a little bit and uh, Olympia, who was Alexander the Great's mother. So as you can see from the image, and if you're not watching it on YouTube, um, on the screen, we have an image of an egg with a snake wrapped around it. And this is called the world egg or the cosmic, cosmic egg. And it's really a myth mythological motif. It's found in many, many cultures, uh, many um, cosmog cosmogonies uh, in any of the Proto-Indo-European cultures and other cultures and civilizations. Uh, typically the egg is always the beginning of something uh, or the universe or some primordial being or some power that created life from nothingness. So, the, and, you know, there's a sort of motif of in the beginning, there was an egg. Actually, it reminds me of um, that question, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, according to mythological and cosmic tradition, the egg comes first. And actually the world or life comes into existence when the egg cracks. Okay? So, uh, you know, now I guess that will add some mystery to when you crack your eggs uh, for breakfast. But the idea that when the, the egg hatches or the egg cracks, depending on which culture or which civilization we're talking uh, about, um, there is often an image of either the cosmic waters running or primordial waters running or a life coming into being because eggs symbolize these two principles that are presented through the egg yolk and the egg white. Does that make sense? Yeah, egg white, yolk and egg white, uh, from which life comes into existence. So it is the most, uh, eggs are actually the most visual um, symbols of life and, and actually of birthing life. 
because you have this liquid and then you have this yolk and then from this comes um life of course you know if we think about women for example and the 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 fertile egg of women from which human life comes from and of course actually now that i'm thinking about it, literally all life on the planet more or less uh comes from a type of egg um then we can see that this connection would have been quite fascinating for early peoples and continue to be fascinating um, as we move forward now the orphic egg um, in Greek tradition, in, in Greek Orphic tradition, is the egg from which hatched the primordial hermaphroditic deity, fanes, or protagonists. So protagonists, I like that word a little bit better. I like that name, although most scholars refer to them as fanes, but protagonist is actually where the word protagonist comes from. And uh, a protagonist, as we know in a story, is usually the lead, or the initiator or the hero, et cetera. And this protagonist or fanes turned and created all the other gods. And so you can see that as a hermaphroditic being, um, this being was able to self-create um, other beings. Yeah, very, very fascinating. Uh, this egg, the Orphic egg is often um, depicted with a serpent wound around it, which is this image that we have here. And Fanes, or protagonist, is often depicted as a golden-winged primordial being. And actually, when we look at some of the early divinities in ancient cultures, let's say even pre-Greek cultures, um, they are often depicted with wings, okay? And whether this is um, a bird imagery or a heavenly imagery. There's lots of debate among scholars of why the early divinities had wings. For example, Artemis in, in, its, in her earliest form has wings as well. And then eventually she loses wings. So there may be something about how early human beings saw gods with the ability to fly. And then I think just out of that social community development that happened, uh, we as humanity started moving or feeling more connected to gods that were more familiar to us or more human-like to us. And so a lot of the divinities lost uh, their wings in their depictions or in art. Anyways, Fanes is this golden wing primordial being who's hatched from this cosmic egg that was the source of the universe. And then see, they become the seed of all the gods and men. In fact, fanes actually it means to bring light or to shine, which of course is related to the Greek the term to shine forth, as well as the Latin Lucifer. Because the Latin Lucifer also comes from light or to bring light or to shine forth. Um, and actually this primordial being born out of this egg and snake combination uh, was part of the or ancient Orphic hymns so in the ancient Orphic hymns, I'm going to read you a little bit. Um, he was addressed this way. Ineffable, hidden, brilliant Xion, whose motion is whirring. You scattered the dark mist that lay before your eyes. And flapping your wings, you whirled about. And through this world, you brought pure light. Wow. Right? So this idea that in the beginning, there was an egg with a serpent around it. And in that cracking, a being that was um, complete, complete. And by that, I mean in their sort of sexual organs and, and reproduction organs, it was complete in the sense that this they could birth um, asexually. No, that's the right, the wrong word, biologically speaking. Um, but they could birth new gods and new and men, and us, I'm assuming women as well, and people. Uh, fascinating, fascinating story of uh, fanes. So if you're interested in fanes, you can uh, look, look them up. Now, of course, like I said, fanes was believed to have been hatched from the world egg of Kronos, which is the passing of time, not the Titan Kronos but Kronos and Ananki. So Ananki, we're going to speak to, we're going to speak about next um, as the mother of all creatures, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, he also created this method of creation 
sorry, he created a method of creation by mingling um, night and time, which is really fascinating. Now, moving on to Olympias, because Olympias was a worshiper of Orphism, which is also a worship of Dionysus, but connected to that early ancestral concept of the Orphic egg. So I wanted to mention Olympias because she is the mother, of course, a mother of Alexander the Great. She lived about mm, 2,500 years ago, the second wife of Philip II of Macedon. And one of the things that's really fascinating about her was that she, according to Plutarch anyways, was a devout member of an orgiastic snake worshiping cult of Dionysus. Yeah. Oh, yes. And now I remember the second monster monsters we're going to do after Medusa is Maenads, because I've looked, I've been, I feel, I feel like I've been in the field of Dionysus, Dionysus and Orphism and snake culture for so long, uh, doing the research for some of this podcast that I have to talk about Maenads. So Olympia is the mother of Alexander the Great may have been considered a Maenad, absolutely. And may have considered herself a Maenad who are these um, wild women that worshiped in the forest um, in honor of Dionysus. But the one thing that's really fascinating about her is that she used to sleep in bed with snakes. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Philip, uh, Philip II um, fell in love with her during this festival in, in Samothrace. And it was actually a festival to Dionysus, believe it or not. And they did end up having two children. So they you know, they shared their bed to some degree, but at some point Philip II said, no, I, I just can't sleep in bed with these snakes. And actually he was starting to feel like she was doing something, her and the snakes were doing something to him while he was sleeping. Now, I mean, you know, I like snakes as much as the next guy. Sleeping with snakes in bed, I don't think that's something that I could do. One snake maybe, but apparently she had several snakes. And I could see why Philip II might have said to himself, you know, this is a little bit weird. And also in the position that he was in, of course, especially after she had Alexander and her goals became, you know, put Alexander on the throne. Um, I could see why he may have been somewhat afraid of sleeping next to her and her snakes. Yeah. Uh, but she was very, very famous. Um, and her daughter, Cleopatra, is actually one of the ancestors of, of course, later Cleopatra IV, uh, the seventh, sorry, who is the um, famous Cleopatra that we all have seen in Hollywood and, and know historically. And ironically, Cleopatra VII, even, you know, 300 years later, because Cleopatra VII sort of came um, around, she ruled between 51 to 30 BCE, she also was a master of snakes. And of course, maybe some of you know that in the end, uh, she took her life through snake poisoning. Uh, so there's this long association between power of primordial beings, creation, and women who handle snakes, who are powerful through snakes. So it's, it's fascinating to me because when I think about women and snakes today, I think about so many women that fear snakes. And, you know, I really wonder what that says about our indoctrination in patriarchy. Because we have become afraid, terrified of the very thing that used to give us power. I mean, if you think about that for a minute, it's, it's fascinating how the human psyche, especially through oppression and subjugation, and of course, indoctrination and brainwashing. And we're gonna get to how that started actually at the very end of the podcast, because I am going to talk about Eve. Of course, I'm gonna talk about Eve in the Garden of Eden. But I just want you to consider how as women, we run from, we scream at, you know, we, oh my God, right? Um, at the very thing that used to give us our power. One of the things, you know, there's lots of things, but this, this snakes are really fundamental to women's power and what we call snake knowledge. And, uh, and that's something that we are now uh, running away from. Yeah. So let's head to the beginning. I mentioned Ananki. 
And so I would like to talk about her um, as one of sort of the top, the top goddesses that are connected to snake knowledge and snake culture. Yeah. Now, Ananki herself, in Greek, Ananki means a uh, force or constant necessity or almost like obsession, inevitability, that kind of thing, compulsion. She's often depicted holding a spindle, which is interesting. She is also one of the Greek primordial deities. Okay? And she is born alongside her brother Kronos, who is the personification of time. So not the Titan Kronos that ended up eating all his babies, but Kronos, um, the, the father of time, or the personification of time, I think is probably better. So Ananki and Kronos are brother and sister, but they're also consorts. And Ananki is considered one of the most powerful dictators of fate and circumstance. Okay. Mortals as well as gods respected her power and paid her homage. She is often considered the mother of the fates or the mother of the Moiras or the Moirais, and she is thought to be the only being that can influence their decisions originally. Sometimes Zeus is depicted as being able to influence their decisions, for example, in the case of Hercules, but Ananki is the only divinity that can persuade the fates to change their minds. Yeah. So her and the fates have been tied together um, in Greek mythology for a very, very long time. Now, like I said, in um, Orphic mythology, Ananke is a self-formed being who emerged at the dawn of creation in an incorporeal serpentine form, her outstretched arms encompassing the cosmos. So think about the cosmos as the egg, okay? And her outstretched arms from her snake body encompasses the cosmos yeah and so um together ananki and chronos of course being consorts and then mingle together in, in ananki serpent form as a tie around the universe and it is said that together they crushed the egg of creation and inside the egg of creation was earth heaven and sea so in a way, these two beings that create the serpent form, Ananki, of course, being the stronger of the two, um, created the world as we know it from this cosmic egg, right? Fantastic. Uh, Ananki is also the mother of Agisteia, who is the distributor of rewards and punishment. Now, Ananki, believe it or not, um, is also in Orphic hymns. Often, um, for example, in Orphic hymns, she is described as Aphrodite Urania. There is this interesting connection between Ananki as the serpent mother and Aphrodite, who, as you know, comes out of the sea. So Aphrodite has always had this very mysterious um, origin because of course she's one of the primordial deities and when the greeks showed up you know they they kind of attached her to the castration of the titan chronos and uh no, sorry uranus uranus not the titan and uh they, they sort of made up a background story for her because they just couldn't figure out you know where did she come from um and she was more powerful i think than being the daughter of zeus and so often Ananki as the creator of the universe, uh, sorry, as the, as the creator of the world is depicted also alongside Aphrodite. So in this case, Aphrodite Urania or Uranus um, is, is in the Orphic um, hymns. So here's what the Orphic hymns say about um, Ananki. So Urania, illustrious, notice the light symbolism. Yeah. Laughter loving queen, sea born, night loving, an awful mean. Crafty, crafty, keep this, this word in mind. From whom Ananki first came, producing nightly all connecting dame. Tis thine the world with harmony to join, for all things spring from thee, O power divine. The triple morai are ruled by thy decree, and all productions yield alike to thee. Yeah. 
Uh, that's from the Orphic Hymn to Aphrodite Urania and, of course, Ananke. So I want you to think about this word crafty because it's going to come up. It's often associated with serpents and snakes and particularly with women. In fact, if you think about that famous uh, film, The Craft uh, is about young witches. You know? And in fact, when you think about witches and witch work and witch tradition, uh, crafting or the craft is often the word used there. And that word and that terminology is connected directly to snakes or serpents as they are seen to be crafty due to that snake knowledge that I often talk about. Yeah. Um, Plato also in his Republic discusses the parentage of the Morai or the fates. And he also uh, talks about Ananke as being the mother. So he says, um, to quote Plato, there were... A and there were another three who sat around about at equal intervals, intervals, excuse me, each one on her throne, the Morai, the fates, so there are three. They were the daughters of Ananke. They were clad in white vestments uh, with filleted heads. So they had these gold fillets um, in their hair, like Kestis and Clotho and Atropos, who sang in unison with the music of the Serenus or the Sirens, like Cassis, singing of the things that were, so the past, Clotho, the things that are, the present, and Atropos, the things that are to be, so the future, yeah? Lachesis, of course, is the maiden or the youngest of the daughter of Ananke. So Ananke is a serpent goddess who, a serpent mother, who in unison with Kronos or time, breaks the egg, the cosmic egg, and creates earth, sea, heaven, as well as the three fates that have dominion over the destiny of human beings. So a massively powerful divinity, massively powerful. And I'll, I will tell you as a person who teaches Greek mythology, excuse me, and Greek history or Greco-Roman history, and then Minoan history, et cetera, all these kinds of histories, I have never taught of an Anki in the way that I'm speaking to you now um, and I'm, I'm shocked at myself. Um, sometimes I throw her in there as a, sort of a, you know, an ancestral um, deity. But when I started looking deeper into her recently, and especially with the connection with the snakes and just finding her so powerful, you know, we always refer to Gaia, right? Because Gaia as earth, as mother, Gaia has a much, was a much more popular goddess. Um, and picked up you know popularity even with the romans and continues to be popular even today i mean there the term gaia is used so um repeatedly in popular culture and everybody sort of knows what gaia is as as mother nature or mother earth or etc and so that terminology i think is sort of the the way that the beginning of greek the greek pantheon begins and yet the truth is that ananke is actually the one that cracks the egg from which let's say if we associate Gaia with mother earth the earth is inside this egg and so really then Ananke is the mother or the creator the the cosmic creator the primordial creator um, even before Gaia arrives on the scene so some fascinating connections fascinating connections here yeah. and so with Next, we move forward into actually one of my favorite uh, of today's podcast. Oh my God, I have so many favorites. Actually, I'm going to say that about the next two as well, <laughs> uh, which is the Pythia, the Oracle of Delphi. So you remember that um, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about snakes, of course, and we talked about, oh, actually, even when we talked about caves, sorry, we talked about that Python cave um, in South Africa that dates back, you know, 10,000 years or 7,000 years. And so this concept of this powerful snake, the python, is older in the human psyche than even the Oracle of Delphi. Well, the Oracle of Delphi, of course, had a priestess named Pythia, referred to as Pythia. Um, and that terminology, of course, comes from the right from the word pytho, which actually in myth is believed to have been the original name of Delphi, okay? 
Uh, however, the Greeks are said to, to have derived this name um, from the verb puthain. I don't know if that makes sense, uh, which really means to rot. And actually, this uh, verb refers to the sickly sweet smell from the decompo decomposing body of the monstrous python after she was slain by Apollo. So, oof, there's so much to say about the Pythia because there is this very long tradition that predates the Greeks, of course, um, at Delphi, where women sat and prophesied or were considered oracles uh, or foreseer, foreseers. And the fact that the snake is considered to be female, the python, the fact that, of course, this male god Apollo comes in and slays the snake. So much slaying of snakes and slaying of female monsters that we're going to be seeing in the next few weeks um, in this podcast. And then, though, the fact that the woman, the Pythia, the oracle, becomes the subject of Apollo who slain the female python is such a a manipulation, a, a form of gaslighting, really ancient gaslighting, if you think about it, um, because what, what really the Greeks were saying is we have brought this masculine power, this God that we love, because of course everyone loved Apollo uh, um, for so long, and he has slain the power of the goddess or the python and has replaced that python with an oracle that is quite powerful, but answers to him. You see what I'm saying there? You see how patriarchy sort of in storytelling takes over and manipulates the power of women and the connection between women and snakes. You know, again, making the snake being something that is to be slain, to be destroyed uh, by men. Yeah. And so we're going to make that connection over and over again when we talk about snake monsters, female snake monsters, who are also slain by male heroes. Okay, so there, again, there's this repeated message throughout time for women that power is dangerous, scary, I want to say unnatural in quotation marks for women, and therefore it turns them into monsters in quotation marks and that these women have to be destroyed by a glowing, power, physically powerful, uh, godly favored man. And that's how uh, harmony is restored, yeah? I say harmony in quotation marks as well. So for at least 12 centuries, the Oracle of Delphi spoke on behalf of the gods, particularly Apollo, but pre-Apollo, like I said, lots of other divinities. Uh, the oracle advised rulers, citizens, philosophers, everything. And, 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 and the advice was on everything from sex lives to state affairs, okay? Uh, of course, originally, historians believe that this shrine at Delphi was a shrine to Gaia, the earth goddess. But the temple by the eighth century BCE became dedicated to Apollo, the god of prophecy. And the oracle spoke with his voice, right? Um, now, there's lots of theories about how this actually physically took place for the oracle. And what I mean by that is, were there gas fumes coming out from the earth? Um, was there something in the water that the oracle drank? So was there something um, organic that created these hallucinations or seizures or um, so-called so -called prophecies for people who maybe don't believe um, in oracles? And there's been lots of scientists who talk about um, how this space, uh, the underlying underneath the temple of Apollo, it turns out to be um, a type of limestone, an oily lim limestone that is fractured uh, by two hidden faults that cross exactly under the ruined temple. And this creates a path through which petrochemical fumes could rise up um, and induce vision. So today, if you've been to Delphi, oh, actually, I was going to share in the background of this um, image, you can see the image of um, the, the um, Temple of Apollo. I've, I went, last time I went to Delphi, which was a few years ago now, it's a beautiful site, it's wonderful. 
they say that the two the two fault lines or the two cracks right underneath the um this temple here today have closed and so that now there are no more fumes coming up i don't know if they just say that for tourists so tourists don't worry about it or if that's really the case uh of course the pythia was removed by the romans uh about 300 ce common era and so you know there have been no no oracles or visions there at least officially um in you know 2000 years so when i went there the you know the guides and the uh, the experts in the field that were with us talked about how because these two fault lines had closed there was no more um visions there were mo no more in inducing of these um raptures right that were said that the Pythia, the Pythia would experience um others also say that methane gas came up through these cracks and of course methane gas um induced visions again there's lots of other theories there's an, a theory that oleander right which causes symptoms similar to that of a seizure or a Pythia, a Pythia, a Pythia, a pathetic oracle of vision is a drug that's put into either in smoke or chewed or some people have argued that it's in the water that uh, the oracle drank so there's lots of there's a lot actually there's been a debate like this for the last sort of hundred years um about what what the oracle or how the oracle was able to have these visions now I can't tell, to be honest, if the debate among scholars, particularly male scholars, is the attempt to debunk that there was any true visions or true revelations, historically speaking, or if the debate is a genuine curiosity as to how there would have been so many visions for 12 centuries or more. And so, I'm often torn in telling the story because, you know, there is some credit to scientific research and to two fault lines being right underneath this temple. And the, the Pythia does go down into the basement of the temple uh, to get ready. And sometimes that's, it's from there that she gives her visions. So there is something to be said to the possibility that these visions are induced by some type of either drug coming through the floor or a drug in the water or the food or the smoke etc that being said the tradition of prophecy is as old as time in using some type of hallucinogenic and of course the argument there is that the human brain in our conscious state aims towards rationality, aims towards categories, categorization and routine and sort of hard facts. And so it grounds us in these things and we are incapable in our conscious mind of accessing the beyond. And so in numerous traditions across the world, uh, shamans and other sacred people um, of different communities take some type of a hallucinogen like mushrooms or uh, Palea, uh, what's the, I can't remember the exact word, um, but in order to access um, an altered state of mind. And I think in the last sort of 2000 years, we've continually bashed and attached negativism to this practice. And perhaps some of it is because we don't want everybody else to go off on all these hallucinogenic trips and, you know, trying to connect to the divine, but, you know, there's a judgment there and there is a modern judgment there that's being made. So uh, make a long story short, is it relevant whether or not the Pythia was under the influence of some type of gas or, or hallucinogen? Uh, because all many other shamans and priests also practice this. Does that mean that she didn't see the visions that she did? There's numerous, numerous stories of her prophecies that came true, or her prophecies that were um, proven to be truth later. And so this is a tricky, uh, a tricky area, I think, 
for us in the modern world, because we want a kind of explanation that makes sense, makes sense. And by that, I mean, scientifically makes sense. And then we also want the mystery of the space. Interestingly, though, the argument is made that once the fault lines were closed or once the, the uh, power of women was removed from this space, that there were no more prophecies to be made in this space. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, I do want to talk a little bit about how the Pythia was chosen. Okay. So the Pythia was originally um, chosen as a young woman. Um, and in the beginning, when so sort of in the early phase of the Apollonian Oracle or Pythia, she was selected from a group of high ranking families. And, but the lifespan of Apathia was quite short. And uh, while they had enjoyed many privileges of, you know, education, freedom from taxation, um, freedom from literally any other responsibilities, their lives were cut short. And so this is actually where sometimes the methane gas theory comes in. And the idea was that, of course, if you are subjected to methane gas nine months of the year, because it was nine months that of the year that Apollo was said to be at Delphi, um, you're especially starting, let's say at the age of 12, you're not going to live very long. So what happens interestingly is over a period of time, we move away from uh, high ranking daughters coming to play, the, to, to play, to be in the role of the Oracle. And we move into um, lower ranking daughters or actually uh, there is a time when we have about three or more um, women or young girls uh, who act or take turns in the role of the oracle. And uh, this is often explained as, oh, the oracle is um, tired or it is exhausting to go through the process, et cetera, et cetera. And so we need uh, a few women here who can channel the God. Um, and I think that makes sense, literally, but also it is because I think that whatever the experience was, or whatever induced some of the hallucin hallucinations or the prophecies or the visions was very taxing on the bodies. And a lot of Pythias um, didn't live very long. Uh, the, interesting uh, the interesting part of the Pythia, of course, is that even some of the women who were oracles were even often married and had children. And so then they would, they would be called to be uh, the oracle and they would leave their families and join um, the, the priestess uh, caste, and they would really uh, be able to shed all their familial or cease all their familial responsibilities or marital relations or anything like that. And they would you know, be the oracle. So in some ways, women were able to escape their traditional roles within uh, their communities and, and become this, um, powerful being. And then by the end, really, by the later periods, it was all mostly uneducated peasant women that were chosen for the role. Um, and actually, historians criticize the level of poetic um, prophecies. So in sort of early centuries, the poetic prophet, the, the prophecies were highly poetic, as these women were more educated. And by the later periods, by the end, the prophecies become uh, more direct conversations, less poetry. And so uh, lots of historians talk about how that was because of the education of the women, um, you know, who, um, who were being oracles. Um, during, the t during the main period of the oracle's popularity, um, as many as three women, like I said, served as the Pythia, and then they, take, they took turns giving prophecies, um, and they also were said to uh, take care of the fire. And sometimes uh, some um, ancient historians talk about that they were also guarding a snake within the temple itself. Yeah. So very, very interesting, um, what do you call it? 
mm, very interesting aspect of what it was, what it took to be an oracle. Mm. Let me just check for time to make sure we have enough time for the other two. Okay, so let's move on to Echidna. Um, if you're interested in Fia, I'm starting to think that maybe we should do a whole podcast on her um, because I haven't even had a chance to talk to you about the navel of the world um, and also the entire process of each um, Oracle day, which uh, takes, uh, takes a, you know, a week in preparation. It takes a long time in preparation and it's quite meaningful. So maybe we'll add this to a future podcast as a singularity, yeah, as a singular discussion. Because I do want to talk about Echidna, the mother of vipers. Okay. Um, I think, again, she's one of these uh, goddesses that is overlooked in Greek mythology and in mythology, actually, um, overall. So Echidna is, she was a half monster, so half woman, half snake. She lived alone in a cave. So here we have that cave snake woman connection again. Um, and she was the consort, or she was the mate of a fearsome monster, Typhon. Typhon also sounds interesting, like Python. But anyway, and she's the monster, she's the mother of many, many monsters, many famous monsters. Now, the oldest uh, genealogy that we have of Echidna is found in Hesiod's Theogony. And Hesiod is a little bit. Uh, vague about Echidna. I'm guessing it's because she was such a primordial being that even he um, mixed her with some of the more modern in his time um, snake goddesses, because there are so many snake goddesses in the ancient Greek world. It's really fascinating. So according to him, Echidna was born uh, to a she. So this sort of um, in unknown she, and many think that he actually meant sea, that she was born to a sea or the sea goddess, Sito or Keto, depends on your pronunciation. So making her likely, um, making her father likely the sea god uh, forces. Like I said, she could be anybody, but um, we can associate her with perhaps the sea, just like Aphrodite. So there is this sense that primordial goddesses come out of the waters of the sea, right? Come out of the, the unknown of the sea. Yeah. Uh, so she has, uh, she may, who know, her parentage is, I would say her parentage is definitely water related, okay? Echidna is described as having a, the head of a beautiful woman with long hair and a serpent body uh, from the neck down. There's different uh, interpretations of her. Sometimes she's the, you know, she's she's more all snake with sort of a human face, and she has really terrible and frightening eyes. Yeah. So her and Typhon bared or bore fierce offspring. Uh, the first one, of course, is Orthos, who's the two-headed dog that guarded the cattle uh, of Geryon. But the second and probably most uh, popular is uh, Cerberus, who is the three-headed dog or the multi-headed dog that guards the gates of Hades. Yeah. And the third, actually, maybe equally as popular, is the Lernian Hydra, the many-headed serpent, the one that when you cut off her head, another one grows back. Um, and the Hydra is actually one of the beasts or monsters that I'm considering uh, doing a podcast on. Because again, a very fascinating history, again, of a snake monster goddess that is once again, of course, defeated by that male uh, dominance, which of course is Hercules. Uh, she's also, uh, Echidna is also said to be the mother of the Chimera who's the fire breathing beast that's part lion, part goat, and has a snake headed tail. Um, and so there, she's the small, and of course, most famously, actually, she is the mother or said to, um, her descendants are the Finx, which is the, the monster that's the head of a woman uh, and the body of a winged lion. Another monster that I would like to add to my monster list for the podcast. 
uh, and the Nemean lion, of course, killed as by Hercules as his first labor. So uh, Echidna, interestingly, is sort of forgotten in history, and yet she is the serpent mother, right? She's half woman, half snake, however that is described, who gave birth with Typhon, um, who created with Typhon, but gave birth to these monsters that are often powerful, frightening, and in the human imagination for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, if you think about the Sphinx, you know, we have an entire massive ancient building dedicated uh, to her. Um, according to Hesiod, Echidna was born in a cave, not surprisingly, and lived in this cave alone. Um, and Hesiod describes it as beneath the secret parts of the holy earth, deep down below the rock, far from the deathless gods and mortal men. Okay. So again, this idea that in the darkness, yeah, this is why I love caves so much. In the darkness grows power. And if we associate it, for example, to the Python cave that we saw uh, in South Africa or in that, in that area, uh, Botswana is what, where it was, um, this idea that this connection between the earth and the snake and knowledge in the darkness appears over and over and over again. It is, it is mind-blowing how many times we see this association over and over and over again. And, you know, like Jung would talk about how this is a clear indication of our subconscious, you know, trying, trying to come to light because of course the subconscious or the unconscious is, is in the darkness and it's in the unknown. And actually it's the thing that we fear about ourselves the most is, is relaxing into or digging into our unconscious. And of course, Freud is famous for saying, um, if we could see all of the, all of our unconscious, subconscious, um, we may lose our conscious mind uh, because we can't, we are overwhelmed with either the knowledge or whatever lies in that darkness. And this concept is repeated over again with the darkness of uh, the deep ocean, right? From which some of these creatures have come. And so what an association over and over again, uh, a symbolic association of the power of both the serpent and the cave and that sort of female reproductive power, right? Um, Many of many historians, including uh, Herodotus, who comes later, talk about her perhaps coming or her cave being somewhere on the southern coast of the Black Sea. Um, Herodotus talks about um, a story in which Heracles comes into contact with a sneaky creature. Um, Again, and actually this, actually this is an interesting uh, story of Heracles because he comes across this snaky creature, this snaky goddess uh, one morning um, as he was driving the cattle of uh, Geryonis. And as you know, they, they ran away from him and he's looking for the cattle and he comes across this cave. And inside this cave is a half woman, half serpent, okay? And she had had the horses, they had gone to, to, to um, hide in her cave. And she promises to give them back to Heracles if he would have sex with her, yeah. of course. Uh, and Heracles agrees. And actually she has three sons by him. So Agatherius, Gelanus, and Scythes. Um, and then she asks Heracles, what, what am I gonna do with your sons? Shall I keep them here? Cause this is where I live or shall I send them to you? Uh, and Heracles is said to famously give her a bow and a belt and tell her that when the boys are grown, Whoever can draw the bow and wear the belt, keep him and then banish the others. Yeah. And we're told that the youngest son, Scythes or Scythes, fulfills the requirements and becomes the founder of the Scythians. Um, so the implication here is that that goddess is Echidna and that she had been in this cave um, for a long time. And then of course was looking for a, a consort and Heracles becomes her consort. Um, so that's a really interesting story. That's a later story in Herodotus, uh, about her as a serpent seducer. Yeah. Um, another really interesting, uh, story about Echidna as the viper. 
uh, who is cast in the abyss by Philip the Apostle comes later in the apoc apocryphal acts of Philip. Here, though, she's called a dragon or drachina, uh, the mother of serpents, the mother of serpents. Amazing. Uh, and this echidna rules over many other dragons and snakes. She, yet she lives, though, in a gated temple where she's worshipped by people and the land. Um, and she, along with her temple priests, were swallowed up by the ground that opened beneath her as a result of Philip, the apostle's curse. Yeah. So again, this conquest, this, um, in this case, of course, with Philip of the apostle, you know, we're moving into Christianity and the conquest of female paganism and uh, pagans overall, right? Those who um, don't worship um, Jesus. And particularly because she's associated with snakes and dragons, this makes her particularly evil, right? Um, so very fascinating history, I think, of, Ak of Akidna. She's often associated also with the monster that we talked about just uh, a minute ago that Apollo slays at Delphi. And um, the idea is that she is the actual python uh, that um, Apollo slays there. Um, that's part of the, um, the Homeric hymn to Apollo, where uh, Apollo is said to, name, to, to kill the nameless she serpent Drachina, which is again the same as uh, reference to her as in other uh, history. Of course, she's also sometimes referred to as a Delphine. Um, who had been uh, Typhon's foster mother. So there's a sort of overlapping imagery of a female serpent goddess, half maid, half snake, that are a plague to men and that are either seduced or seducing or that are killed by, for example, in this case, Apollo or Philip the Apostle, et cetera. So Echidna, I think, is one of those divinities that we don't talk about very often. We don't credit, actually, enough very often. And again, is a deity that lives in a cave and is associated with deep serpent knowledge. So now we're going to move on to the last and perhaps the most influential of all snake goddesses, uh, the snake or serpent in the Garden of Eden. So I'm using these two images. Um, if you are listening on Spotify, um, I want to clarify which images I'm using. So I'm using the creation of Eve by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel and the original sin, sin, sin that, excuse me, and the expulsion from the garden also in the Sistine Chapel um, in, uh, by Michelangelo. Now, I've been to the Sistine Chapel um, and it was actually quite a disturbing experience because what happened was uh, I was with a tourist group, a tour group, and we were cattled almost or corralled into this so the the bottom the under you know the floor of the Sistine Chapel was divided literally by these rails and people would come in they would let you know I don't know 100 people come in and they would sort of place them in these rails I was one of them it was dark because they said that the light affects the paintings you had to look up and these are very far from the ground you couldn't take pictures and you couldn't speak so you literally got to sit there, I think it was five, 10 minutes, nine, I don't know, and just look up in silence. And you were supposed to appreciate and in darkness and appreciate the paintings that I couldn't see. Certainly my eyes, uh, I should have probably put on my glasses because my far away vision is a bit off. So I couldn't see anything except just like bluish and some colors at the top and you can't say anything and you can't talk to anybody. And then sort of on the other side opened, the gates opened, uh, these railings opened like, like a roller coaster ride and, uh, and, you, and you would leave. And I thought to myself, like I could see these better on Google than having paid for this tour. Now I did go through the Vatican as well, but <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. And so people talk about seeing these paintings and I don't really know what their experience were like. If your experience is different, please drop a comment in there and let me know. Um, 
but yeah, my experience was really weird. And the fact that we were corralled and silenced and just in a way forced to enjoy the art uh, that we could barely see was uh, really, uh, it was actually quite a unique experience. I don't think I've ever been to any other place that, uh, a little bit of silence, yes. But uh, like when you go to an art museum or an art gallery, you know, but wow, it was incredible. So I've pulled these off the internet so that, and you can look them up anytime. They're, you're probably very familiar with them, but maybe you hadn't looked at them quite as carefully. Um, I want to bring up the creation of Eve because I don't think that, I think we're very familiar with the creation of Adam with the two fingers meeting, you know, God giving life or knowledge or whatever um, to Adam. So I think we're very familiar with that image, but I don't think that we are as familiar with the creation of Eve. Um, and Michael, Michelangelo had frescoed this scene right in the center of, um, in, of the ceiling. Uh, although it might have been harder for me to see from my position in the in the in the railings where I was there in the stocks. Um, the first, of course, uh, story of Genesis is the figure of God. And then um, Adam is sleeping. So I'm just describing it to some of you who are not maybe watching it on YouTube. Adam is sleeping on the bottom left hand sign, right? Um, and Eve was just made by God, right? So she is kind of in this uh, prostrate position. It looks like um, she is just starting to stand up. Yeah. Um, and the lines are really great. The, the art itself is fantastic, of course. Um, but you can see that God is sort of in this priestly almost uh, or high priest kind of outfit. So God is this older man uh in this priest outfit that the the image of both adam and eve are sort of adolescent and eve has her hands in like a prayer position looking up right in a sort of childish days manner almost as 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 though she's thanking the creator and adam is lying asleep on a rock <laughs> you know michelangelo certainly had a sense of humor um <laughs> Of course, this is sort of part of the, this is part of the biblical story, because Adam is put to sleep when his so-called rib is taken and, and, and shaped into Eve. But um, I find Michelangelo's kind of humor, not humor, satire, really, uh, in the fact that Adam is completely oblivious to the creation of woman. Uh, and of course, that woman is created in a bowing, thankful um, position. I find that really fascinating. Now, there are two stories, of course, of this creation, the creation of man and woman. The first one, of course, is in Genesis 1, 24 to 28. Um, and I'm just going to read you a little bit. Uh, from it. So then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and all over the creatures who move around. So God created mankind in his own image, the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Okay. And he says to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish and birds and sky and everything else. So that's the Genesis one story, which is not our Michelangelo image where man and woman were created at the same time and in the image of God. Uh, now I, we don't have time here to go into sort of the um, origins of the story of Genesis one, but it's fascinating because of two things that I think you've heard in me reading that God is referred to in the plural and Adam and Eve are created in the image of this plural God. And so we've talked about this when we looked at Lilith many, many weeks ago, the idea of course being that they were created equal and that both are a reflection of the divine or the embodiment of the divine. But then the one that the aspect that Michelangelo is pulling forward here, of course, is in Genesis two in between somewhere between 15 to 23, where God commands the uh, man, right? You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. 
And then God looks at Adam and says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm going to make a helper suitable for him. So notice the change in tone here. Okay. And then this is the scene that Michelangelo is drawing. Uh, the Lord forms out of the ground, out of the ground, all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brings them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever man called each living creature, that was its name. Okay. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. So that's Michelangelo's painting. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Okay. Then the Lord made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. So I want you to think about this just because as a kid, you know, in Sunday school, I found this quite disturbing and I could not make the logic of it. And I still cannot make the logic of it. So a male divinity that has created man in his own image takes a piece of the male to create the woman, right? So two men create, two men create life. Yeah. Uh, I find this fascinating. I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way. God in this, in Genesis one, God is certainly multiple and plural. And so then you have those uh, individuals who say, well, to me, God has no gender. I, I get that. But in Genesis two, it is very clearly a male divinity. And it is very clear that this male divinity is creating life by taking a piece of another male and shaping it into a completely different different human in the sense that uh, uh, biologically different human, maybe not completely, that, that's overstating it, <laughs> but a biologically different human. And then this new human, the woman, becomes the servant of the male because she is created from him. And yet in nature, and certainly in the Greek mythology we've talked about for weeks, women are birthing and creating life. Yeah. I mean, that's the way it still happens uh, with help. Yeah. But I mean, I find this fascinating, fascinating um, that it's two men creating a woman and that she's somehow now subservient to them because they had created life. And in Michelangelo's painting, the creation of Eve, I think this is perfectly depicted because Adam is passed out. God is this male, older, stern figure, priest figure. So there's a, a, a sacred aspect of him. And, you know, Eve is like a dazed and confused woman that's just kind of bent over there asking and, and hoping for something. I don't know, her hands are in sort of prayer, hoping for something. Uh, so I found, I find this imagery fascinating and something that I think we overlook, um, I've read this, this paragraph numerous times, of course, to my students and to others and to myself, because I've, you know, you, you, you read the Bible every now and then, but in preparation for this podcast, again, I was reading it and I'm like, it is so unnatural the way that creation is depicted in Genesis two, so unnatural that you cannot help but think, what is the purpose of reconfiguring something that occurs naturally in nature, which is of course, women birthing. It's, it's, it's fascinating. Sorry, <laughs> I'm going off on a rant. The second picture, of course, that I have here and that relates to snakes is uh, based on Genesis 3, which is often referred to as the fall or original sin or et cetera. And the most fascinating aspect about this painting, and I, and I chose it because it's one of the one that's most clearest is that Michelangelo breaks with tradition on how he depicts the snake. So the snake, you know, for centuries was traditionally represented with a small human head, usually a female. So this is not that unusual that the snake is female, speaking to a female. Uh, but Michelangelo here turns into a full-fledged woman snake whose legs, whose like serpentine body stretch and wrap around the tree of knowledge. So again, this is an imagery that connects back to our very first image, which is the Orphic egg, where we have the snake wrapped around the egg, which again, the egg is the creation of life and the world. 
Here, Michelangelo wraps the serpentine uh, figure around the tree of knowledge and gives her uh, a female body. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can see here on the bottom, um, Eve is reaching uh, for the, um, both actually Adam and Eve are reaching for the apple or the, not, actually it's not an apple, I'm sorry, my bad. Uh, probably a fig. Because uh, there were no apples, of course, back in the Middle East when the early Hebrews wrote their story. Uh, so there is no apple in the actual um, story of Genesis 3 either. So you could see that they're reaching, that Adam is reaching into the tree to grab, let's say, a fig or a fruit. And Eve is actually reaching her hand out to the snake woman who's given her the fruit, the snake, uh, I'm sorry, the fruit of knowledge. Uh, so I think, again, Michelangelo has a bit of like a tongue in cheek because the, my favorite thing that he does here is that both of them, both Adam and Eve are reaching for the fruit at the same time. The only difference of course, is that the woman is reaching towards the snake woman. Uh, so there's a connection there that he creates. And I would not be surprised if Michelangelo, I mean, if you know much about Michelangelo's art, you know that he was always in contention with the Catholic church and that he hid a lot of imagery in his paintings and that he was irked to say it nicely, um, to uh, by the Catholic Church and the pressures they put on him, and he saw some of the hypocrisy of um, what was happening in his time. Um, and of course, you know, he was gay, uh, so that must have been quite difficult for him. Um, um, and he didn't want to come back and paint. And anyways, there's lots of stories with Michelangelo. I, I, in fact, I think most people don't talk about his life experiences enough. Uh, but one of the things, if you know about him, is that he did hide some of his knowledge and resentment um, into his art. So what is the snake woman doing um, in the tree or wrapped around the tree of life? So I'm going to read you a little bit of Genesis 3. Now, the serpent who was more crafty, again, you see the word crafty, yeah, or cunning. So we've associated this word, instead of seeing it as strategic knowledge, secret knowledge or snake knowledge, we've associated it in a negative way. Uh, so the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord made, supposedly the Lord made serpent, says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, literally, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent says to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this is my favorite part. I always ask my students, is the serpent lying? Who's lying here? Is the serpent lying? Do they die after they eat this fruit? Or is God lying? So I leave that to you. I know that there's a lot of um, theories that it's a spiritual death or an innocent death or whatever death. Uh, but in the actual text, you know, dying is described as dying. Yeah? There's no other, there's no, there's no uh, other commentary. And then the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. Okay, so women seeking wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed some fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So there's so much in there, so much in there. Adam is standing right there as the serpent is speaking. Again, referring to Michelangelo's uh, painting. Where is the temptation? So we've seen so much imagery. And of course, if we look back uh, in the last 2000 years and the accusations of women as, as an Eve as being the temptation and the destruction of humanities, I want you to show me, perhaps you can show me if you, uh, in the comments, where is the temptation? So they don't even know they're naked at this point. Yeah, they're not aware of their nakedness until they eat the fruit. He's standing right there. So she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. 
So at any point in time, Adam could have said, yo, God said not to eat this. I'm not going to have any. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. But he does not. Yeah. He takes it and he eats it. And they then their eyes are open. And then they realize that they're naked. And then they cover themselves. And then they get caught. Yeah. So then the man and his wife hears the sound of God who was walking in the garden. God is saying, where are you? But they were hiding. Um, and Adam says, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Adam, not the brightest in the bunch. Yeah. <laughs> And God says, um, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And then Adam, ever the gentleman, yeah, says, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Okay, so he throws her right under the bus. Okay? This is definitely not a, a love relationship, certainly not a, worship, a love relationship. And then God turns to the woman and says, is this true? Is this what you've done? And she turns around and says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Uh, did he deceive you? Did the serpent deceive you? Or was knowledge of good and evil something that you thought was worth having as well as, you know, the food of the fruit? So she throws the serpent under the bus. So we have this sort of constant blaming. Yeah? Um, and then, of course, God punishes them all. Uh, he, you know, he makes the woman have pain in childbirth, the man worked the land and the snake, the snake slithering on his body uh, on, on the floor. And actually, this is an interesting aspect because many scholars um, argue that this aspect of this part where God says, you shall be slithering on your belly to the snake implies that perhaps the serpent had legs and arms. Uh, before this happened. So you will see a lot of imagery where the serpent in the Garden of Eden is often depicted as a dragon or with arms and legs or with later the Leviathan, like we've talked about before. So there's a lot of this connection and, and, and question about why is the punishment of the serpent to slither on its belly if it was already a slithering on its belly? And if we were to believe Michelangelo, and the serpent is female, or other artists where the serpent has a female head, um, again, the idea might be that this is an example of punishment for that female power in snakes or snake knowledge that now becomes diminished and, in fact, eventually destroyed. Um, and so then Adam names his wife in Genesis uh, 3.20, named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all living. What bothers me about this is that he names her, like he named the animals. Uh, and I thought to myself, who the hell are you to give her a name? But anyways, uh, and then God makes them some garments of, of skin and, and for both of them, and he clothes them. But what's really fascinating in Genesis 3.22 is that God says, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he banishes them from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which Adam had been taken. Yeah. And so, and after that, actually, he places at the east side of the Garden of Eden a cherubim. Remember, we talked about cherubims and the little um, angels, male little angels and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And so what's really fascinating about this last part of Genesis 3 is that God seems to not want Adam and Eve to be immortal. Now, you know, as a historian, that's pretty clear because in the ancient world, humans did not have any issue with God's knowing that they were above humanity and that they, they didn't see humans as equals. And so I think that this piece here, this last piece at the end, really shows us, again, the plurality of God, because he says, uh, um, Adam and Eve, I don't have now eaten from the um, tree of knowledge, and they have become like us in that way. And so there's a plurality there, and, and there's lots, lots of scholarship around what does that plurality mean or what might it mean. But the interesting aspect is that God here is similar in the sense that, and similar to Zeus, similar to other divinities from other cultures where humans are 
meant to have you know a fatalistic life or a mortal life um and they're not meant to be gods in at least in this realm yeah. so really fascinating aspect of that um and so i think michelangelo really captures this moment really well in this painting and i don't think it's an accident well certainly it's not an accident for michelangelo but it's not an accident um even in the book of Genesis, that the snake connects to the woman. Because as you've seen, not just in this podcast, but the one before, and perhaps even others, the connection between women and snake knowledge and knowledge, primordial knowledge. So when I think about darkness and when I think about the dark seas and the dark cave, what comes to mind, of course, is primordial knowledge, something that has always been there that you can tap into if you know how, or you have the tools, or you have a guide. And so women have always had this connection to that dark knowledge, uh, which is sacred knowledge, knowledge of the other realms, knowledge of the other world, knowledge of the cosmos and of the womb, right? So women have had this ability since time memorial. And what we see happening with modernity, certainly in the last 2000 years or so, is a continuous disconnection, a continuous pull or tug by the new structure of patriarch patriarchy, who is trying to subjugate that power. And of course, eventually is successful because like I said, now women run away from snakes as though they've seen some kind of a monster. Um, and lots of these, divinities that had power, such as Medusa, such as Echidna, such as Ananke, such as the Pythia, are thrown off their seat of power, their throne of power, um, killed, slayed, bashed, etc., cetera, um, by male heroes or male conquerors. So I think that really reflects what happens historically. And I think it's something that we don't talk about as men and women, because the disconnect to what is natural happens for all of us as human beings. Human beings have a drive to connect to the divine in some way. I know that there are, of course, atheists out there and there are people who don't have these beliefs as strongly, but the connection doesn't have to be to a god. It could be to nature. It could be to other humans. It could be to really anything that you, where you have that moment where you're in awe. Okay. And so, that is still a connection, whether you name it a God or not is your choice. So for me, I find it fascinating that humans, despite the fact that people say are oh, moving away from religion, what I actually see is that a lot of people are starting to move towards spirituality, that whether or not that spirituality is religious, they want to connect to something more than themselves, even if it's just the earth. You know? And so that to me, at least, and you may disagree, but that to me is a reconnection to that womb darkness, that cave darkness, that pit within ourselves where we where where the soul resides or where the supernatural resides or where the something more than what we are resides. Um, and I think that that drive is instinctual. And so a lot of that comes out of this snake knowledge ancestry or the snake knowledge mind. So I hope that you have enjoyed today. We are definitely not done uh, with snake goddesses in the sense that they will come up again and again or goddesses of the wilderness. Um, I have this image of, of my book, She Who Hunts and Artemis um, and goddesses of the wild or goddesses of nature. So we are going to move forward into our monsters um, section of the season of our podcast. Uh, so next week, we're gonna talk about Medusa. We're gonna look at Medusa and then talk about a few more monsters. Um, and so we're, you know, we're moving away from purposeful snake imagery and into sort of frightening women imagery. Uh, but um, I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. If you do, did enjoy it, please share it. Um, please let others know. Um, I am a one man team. And so I have to do my own marketing and my own everything. And so if you do enjoy it, and if you do think that others might enjoy it, uh, 
please share and please comment and please like and all the things that make the algorithms um, work properly. Um, I want to thank you for joining me. Um, and I want to thank you for following and subscribing to my podcast and supporting. And again, please feel free to contact me on any of the social media and connect with me with any thoughts, questions, comments, suggestions you might have, stories that you might have. Um, I really love to hear your stories and your experiences. Um, and perhaps one day we can do a, a, a few episodes where we're just talking about people's experiences and people's stories with um, ancient history and with goddesses, but also with different symbolisms and, and divine beings. So thank you so much for joining the Goddess Project podcast. Thank you for being here. I will see you next time uh, when we talk about monsters. Bye, y'all.